Shalom Hadavarnix. Welcome to our next session in the book of Isaiah. We are in session number 28 at this time. We're working our way through the book of Isaiah using Ariel Ministries' exegetical outline notes on the book of Isaiah created by Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. All right, let's do a quick review of where we were last session. Last session we were in chapter 36, verse 1 to 37, verse 6, and we looked there at the invasion by Sennacherib. Hezekiah went into mourning. He put on a sackcloth. Uh, then when we jumped into, uh, we jumped from verse, chapter 37, verse 6 to chapter 37, verse, verse 7, we had just a short one-sentence prophecy about the fate of Sennacherib. And then the prophet jumped back to his present time. And in verses 8 through 20, he dealt with the letter from, uh, from Sennacherib to Hezekiah. Well, Hezekiah took that letter and he spread it out before the Lord in the Temple of Solomon, somewhere there in the temple. He spread it out and then he went to prayer. And so I chose to do a quick um, drosh on the idea of prayer. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. And so I used Hezekiah as an example because King Hezekiah finally turns to God personally in prayer when the situation at Jerusalem seems at its darkest. He had waited so long to pray personally because he knew he was disobedient and out of fellowship with God. And that can happen with us as well. So well, let's practice the uh, biblical admonition to pray without ceasing. When he prayed, when Hezekiah prayed, he sanctified God. He said he was the one who dwells above the cherubim. This is the a reference to the Ark of the Covenant in the uh, in Solomon's temple, and the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, would appear above the mercy seat, between the cherubim, above the cherubim, on the Ark of the Covenant. That was his reference to the Lord, the all-powerful, all-present one. Then he moved from the prophet, the uh, prophet moved from the prophet's present time into the near future in verses uh, 21 to 38. This was a near prediction of a serious defeat and the salvation of Jerusalem. Then back to the prophet's present time again, and we dealt with the, the illness of Hezekiah. In a short-term prophecy, a, a real close, short um, uh, prophecy about the near future in verses four through six, he, the healing of Hezekiah is predicted. Then when we jump back to the prophet's present time, uh, we came in verse seven through 39, four, to the promise of a sign and the psalm of Hezekiah. So this brings us to our uh, new material this session, the curing of Hezekiah. In chapter 38, verses 21 and 22, we look at the actual event of uh, uh, Hezekiah's cure. So the cure is mentioned in verse 21. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Well, God did the healing. God did the healing, but he did it through a specific physical and medical means. He can heal miraculously or he can heal medically, it, but he is the healer no matter what happens. So putting figs on the, be on the boil was the method that God chose to use. Now, exactly what the boil was, exactly what the figs were, exactly how it was all healed, we have no idea. We have no idea uh, what the cure was, but the, we do know that God... Over intend, uh, superintended it, and God was the one who brought the cure. Then in verse 22, Hezekiah asked for a sign. Then, then Hezekiah had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? So this is a reference to appearing before the Lord in temple worship. And of course the sign was the shadow that went back on the stairs. Now we move into chapter 39, verse 1, and we come to the incident of Hezekiah and the Babylonians. There's going to be a visit by the Babylonians to Hezekiah in chapter 39, verses 1 and 2. They are going to be sent by Merodach Baladan. He sends them, but he has ulterior, uh, ulterior motives for sending this delegation and this present to Hezekiah. So let's get introduced to Merodach Baladan in verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, 
for he heard that he, had, that he had been sick and had recovered. Now I'd like to share with you a little um, summary that I presented earlier from the New Geneva Study Bible, bringing in Merodach Baladan. We read earlier that chapters 36 through 39 relay the events of 701 BC when Assyria tried to conquer Judah. After Sargon II died in 705 BC, a rebellion took place early in the reign of Sennacherib. The entire Assyrian Empire was involved. Merodach Baladan of Babylon, there we go, there's our guy. Merodach Baladan of Babylon in the eastern end of the Fertile Crescent and Shabako of Egypt in the western end of the Crescent were the chief troublemakers. Ah, now we see what's going on. This guy has started a rebellion against Assyria and he wants to draw Hezekiah into it. So this timeline will give you a little fix on exactly what was happening there. Merodach Baladan first appeared when he captured Babylon from Assyria in 721 and ruled until 710. So 721 to 710 Merodach Baladan is the king of Babylon. Then Sargon II reconquered Babylon and he ruled Babylon from 710 to 705. S uh, Sargon II then died in 705 and Sennacherib takes the throne, 705 BC. Now Hezekiah's illness occurred sometime prior to 704. We don't know exactly when, but it has to be prior to 704. That's because Merodach Baladan recaptured Babylon in 704 and he ruled nine months until 703, a very, very short rebellion. Merodach Baladan then sends a delegation to Hezekiah during this time, during this uh, short nine month rebellion against Assyria. And he tries to convince Hezekiah to join the rebellion, and he is successful. He's successful in uh, convincing Hezekiah to do this, and so that precipitates the crisis of 701 BC that we've been studying. So that's the historical background for all this. As we come to verse 2 of chapter 39, we encounter the pride of Hezekiah. Chapter 39, verse 2. Hezekiah was pleased, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and his whole armory and all that was found in his treasuries. So he was, there was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. So Hezekiah was glad that they came, that fed his pride to have this envoy come and seek him out. And so he revealed every to, everything to the delegation without any cautions, without any limits. He revealed the treasury, which is his financial resources. He revealed to them everything in the armory, which is his military resources. He revealed everything to them in the palace. That's his political resources. So they were given just an open book into the uh, into the. Uh, kingdom of Judah. They were just given an open look in there. Then comes the inquisition of Isaiah in verse 3. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what, is he, what did these men say? And from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. The questions, what did they say? Where did they come from? Hezekiah's answer, they came unto me. That's his pride speaking. Even from Babylon, from his far country, they sought me out. Isaiah continues in verse 4. He said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. Well, Hezekiah answers, everything. They saw everything. It's an honest confession. An honest confession by Hezekiah. Apparently he begins to realize he might have made a mistake. So he does not attempt to hide anything from Isaiah. He tells him the whole story. But because of Hezekiah's exercise of pride, he will experience consequences. 
And the consequence is described for us in verses 5 through 7. So the message of a new revelation concerning these consequences begins in verse 5. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. At this point, verses 6 and 7 speak of the Babylonian captivity. This is a prophecy of the Babylonian captivity. It will happen approximately 100 years in the future. So the prophet now jumps from his current time in verses 5 through 7 into the near future and the Babylonian uh, prophecy, Babylonian captivity. This will be a long-term prophecy because all who hear this prophecy will be dead by the time it it uh, comes to reality. So the first aspect of this message of judgment from God is that the possession of pride will be taken to Babylon. Verse 6, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Well, the fulfillment of this prophecy is found in 2 Kings 24.13 and a few other verses. Let's take a look at 2 Kings 24.13. Speaking of Babylon, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, we read, He carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. So 2 Kings 24.13 is the cross-reference we've just referred to, but the a full account is also found in 2 Kings 25, 2 Chronicles 36, and Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. So that's the first aspect of the judgment. The possessions of pride will be taken to Babylon. The second aspect is the fact that the royal house will also be taken to Babylon. Verse 7. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away. Well, this is a message of judgment, but it does have some good news in it because, first of all, Hezekiah will have sons. He will have descendants. That is good news because he didn't have any descendants at this time. And, of course, these descendants will carry on the Davidic covenant. Now, the um, fulfillment of verse 7 is found in 2 Kings 24, 14 through 16. There we read, then he led away into exile all Jerusalem and all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he led Jehoiachin away into exile in Babylon, to Babylon. Also the king's mother and the king's wives and his officials and the leading men of the land. He led them away into Babylon from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the smiths, 1,000, all strong and fit for war. And these the king of Babylon brought into exile to Babylon. All right, so the royal house will be taken into Babylon. But we also learn in verse 7 some, mo some more good news, that Hezekiah's descendants will become Babylonian officials. And they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So that is good news because that means they will not be slaves or they will not be slaughtered. They will live and they will prosper in Babylon. And the most famous of these descendants who prospered in Babylon was Daniel. Daniel was Hezekiah's grandson. Of course, we read all about him in the book of Daniel. So there's uh, some good mixed in with the bad uh, in this judgment against Hezekiah's pride. Okay, this time we are in the near future predicting the Babylonian um, captivity. And now in verse 8, we jump back to the prophet's present time and we witness the repentance of Hezekiah. Verse 8. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word which the Lord, excuse me, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and truth in my days. So this is the response of a righteous and true-hearted king, because when he's rebuked, he repents on the spot. You know, he repents on the spot and he accepts 
the discipline to come into his family. Well, 2 Chronicles 32 evaluates this incident, incident with Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 32, 24 through 36 and verse 31. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill and he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. That was the sign of the, the um, sh uh, shadow going back 10 steps. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received. He just kind of took it for granted because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. So God did this miracle in his life. God gave him 15 more years, 14, 15 more years of life. And Hezekiah just treated it as commonplace, as um, casual. That's because his heart was proud. Therefore, he needed to be disciplined. However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart. There, we've just seen that a few moments ago. Both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. That's verse 8 of chapter 39. And now, verse 31 of Second Chronicles 32. Even in the matter of the envoys from the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened to God, God left him alone only to test him testing his pride, showing him what's, uh, what's wrong in his heart, that he might know all that was in his heart. And so Hezekiah was a good king. He was a good king, well, the best, the most godly king uh, Judah ever had, but he was a human being. He had a shortcoming, and so God was busy, busy dealing with Hezekiah's shortcoming, even as he will deal with us because he wants to take all those shortcomings, all those, those little corruptions in our heart and get rid of them. And so he's working on Hezekiah there, even though Hezekiah was such a godly man. So if Hezekiah can be disciplined and dealt with in that manner, what about you and me? What about you and me? All right, well, this brings us to the end of a major section of the book of Isaiah. From this point on, the book will take a major shift. Chapters 1 through 39 dealt primarily with God's denunciation of Israel and with Israel's restoration and consolation being a sub-theme, a sub-theme. Now in chapters 40 through 66, God will deal primary, primarily with Israel's consolation and her den denunciation will become a sub-theme. So at this point, we begin our study of the 10th and final segment of the book of Isaiah. However, before we do that, let's do a drash. Let's do an application of chapters 37 through 39. The theme I chose was start a spiritual journal. Hezekiah did this. Hezekiah did a spiritual journal. He wrote a psalm about his sickness experience, and he praised God for delivering him from this illness. Now, well, let's take a look at a current example. I'm going to use myself as a current example. I have a mementos file in my file cabinet where I stash away encouraging notes or letters or whatever comes my way. I try to save reminders of what God has been doing in my life. So I have started a mementos file. So let's get specific. Let's talk about you as well. Why don't you write down one example of how God is currently busy in your life? Maybe it's a major event like going to a seminary, or maybe it's a smaller event like providing a parking spot down, downtown, something commonplace. But no matter what it is, let's move to a plan of action. Try to think of a way you could continue to record and say for future use the things God is doing in your life today. And so you can be a witness to others about how God has worked in your life over the years. So start a spiritual journal. All right. Verses, verses, chapters, chapters 1 through 39, uh, focused on denunciation and the Assyrian invasion. Now, chapters 40 through 66 are going to focus on consolation and the Babylonian invasion. So now we're going to look at the redemption and restoration of Israel. This section is often referred to as Second Isaiah. Now, the prologue is in verses 1 through 11. So as far as our time frame goes, we move from the prophet's president in verse 8 of chapter 39, and we jump into the kingdom in chapter 40, verses 1 through 26. We begin with the prologue. 
Now the theme of second Isaiah is comfort, comfort. So the command to comfort begins in verse one, chapter 40, verse one. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Now the Hebrew there is all in the plural. It's all in the plural. The plural form doesn't appear in a good number of translations as it does here in the NASB. So a better rendering of verse one is the Jewish Publication Society of 1917. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. This is plural, and so it's speaking to the prophets of Israel. It's speaking to Isaiah, it's speaking to Micah, it's speaking to all the prophets. Because previously they've been bringing a message of judgment, now they bring a message of hope. And the object of that hope, of course, is my people Israel. And the method that they're to use is in verse 2. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her. So the prophets are commanded to literally, literally it says, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Win the heart of the nation. Not simply threaten and denounce, but win the nation to God by speaking in tenderness. This is a romantic term used in courtship. For example, a usage of this term is Hosea 2.14. Uh, Hosea 2.14 reads, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. So it's a term used of wooing a person. God wants Isaiah to woo Israel back to him. And the means, of course, is by proclamation, cry unto her. Now the threefold content of the message of comfort, the threefold cry is in verse Two, the beginning of verse 2. Cry unto her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received double of the Lord's hand. We received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so there's the three points of content regarding Jerusalem's comfort. Her warfare has ended, her iniquity has been removed, she's received double for all her sins. Now this term warfare, her warfare has been accomplished. This, this term warfare is a military ter term. We see in chapter 29, for example, that God is seen as warring against Jerusalem. But now that conflict is finished. So what are the major points of this section? Her warfare has ended or has been accomplished. Well, we'll, we'll come across a contrast between the Lord and idols. That's a major point of this section. We'll also view a contra contrast between Israel and the Gentile nations. We'll look at a deliverance from Babylon the near and Babylon the far. Deliverance from Babylon the near is deliverance by Cyrus of Persia, and deliverance by Babylon the far is deliverance by the Messiah. The fourth point, we'll witness the overthrow of Babylon, Babylonian idolatry, and this will all be developed in chapter 40 through 48. So that's the first section, her warfare is ended. The second section is her iniquity has been removed or pardoned. This gives the reason why her warfare is accomplished. Why has God stopped fighting against Israel? Well, he's pardoned her. That word means to satisfy, to pay for. The idea here is to receive satisfaction by the payment of a debt or to pay the debt of sin by punishment, or perhaps the iniquity is pardoned because punishment has been paid, something like that. So what are the major points of her iniquity has been removed? Number one, we'll see that the sin is pardoned by the substitutionary sacrifice of the servant of the Lord. Second, we'll look at a contrast between the suffering of the servant and his future glory. We'll also witness the exaltation of the servant of the Lord from humiliation to glory and honor. And we'll also see the exaltation of Israel to the height of her calling to be a light to the Gentiles. And this is all developed in chapter 49 through 57. Now the rabbis could never quite understand the contrast between the suffering servant and his future glory and the exaltation of the servant of the Lord from humiliation to glory and honor. They couldn't quite put that all together in one individual. Now we understand the suffering servant to be the Messiah at his first coming and the exalted servant to be the Messiah at his second coming. 
He comes the second time to establish his kingdom. But the rabbis missed, missed by and large this concept and invented the two Messiah theory. The first Messiah is Messiah ben Yosef. He would come and die. And then the second Messiah, Messiah ben David, would come and reign and raise Messiah ben Yosef back to life. So let's take a little bit of a rabbit trail here and examine this two Messiah theory, make you a little more familiar with it. You can get a lot more information about it by picking up the book, The Messiah Text by Raphael Patai. He was an Israeli scholar. I believe he's gone now. And this is still available, however, on Amazon.com, Amazon.com, and it is well worth every penny you spend on it. He's taken all the Messiah texts, both biblical and traditional, and collated them under different headings in one place in this book. So I, really, I would really recommend it very highly. All right, the two Messiah theory speaks of two messiahs, a suffering messiah and then another messiah who is the triumphant messiah. The suffering messiah is known as Messiah ben, Messiah son of Joseph, and the triumphant messiah is known as Messiah son of David. So it's Mashiach ben Joseph, Joseph in this was the suffering Messiah, and Mashiach ben David is the triumphant Messiah. All right, let's take a look at the suffering Messiah, the suffering side of the coin, Mashiach ben Yosef. The suffering Messiah uh, experiences humiliation, he suffers physical harm, he, he uh, undergoes a violent substitutionary death, he dies in the wars of Gog and Magog, and this is covered in verses such as Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. So that's the suffering Messiah side of the coin. Now let's, let's look at the triumphant Messiah side. This is Mashiach ben David. The, the triumphant Messiah is a conquering king. He defeats Israel's enemies. He institutes the Messianic kingdom. He resurrects the suffering Messiah. And this is covered in verses like Genesis 49, 9, and 10. That's a representative verse. So this is the two Messiah theory. Now the unfortunate development in modern times is that the rabbis often hide the suffering Messiah information from Jewish people. They never hear about it. They only hear about the triumphant Messiah. And so the rabbis say, Yeshua, Jesus is not the Messiah because he didn't fulfill the prophecies and they point to the triumphant Messiah prophecies. And we would agree, Yeshua has not yet fulfilled those prophecies. He has not yet fulfilled them. So that's their technique. And it's, it's at all official levels. For example, the Rabbinical Council of America. This is a resolution approved in June 1996 by the RCA. The RCA represents about 1,000 centrist Orthodox rabbis. They said, quote here, there is not and has never been a place in Judaism for the belief that Mashiach ben David, Messiah son of David, will begin his ministry, his messianic mission, excuse me, will begin his messianic mission only to experience death, burial, and resurrection before completing it. So you see what they're doing? They're pointing you to the triumphant Messiah uh, prophecies and ignoring the suffering Messiah side of the coin. So what you have to do is bring out the suffering side of the coin. And uh, not everybody does this. The Chabadniks, uh, the Chabad Lubavitch group, when Rabbi Schneerson died, they grabbed onto the suffering Messiah side of the coin and they said it applies to Rabbi Schneerson. And of course there were some raised eyebrows in the Jewish community over that. Uh, so you've got to uh, bring out both sides of the Messianic coin the suffering Messiah and the triumphant Messiah. And you do that by presenting the New Testament solution to the paradox. See, the rabbis can't figure out how can he be, how can he suffer and how can he be exalted at the same time? Well, there is a solution to that paradox and that's the, not the two Messiah theory, two different Messiahs, but the two advents of Messiah. The same person can experience both. So on the suffering side of the coin, we have the suffering Messiah. That is Yeshua of Nazareth at his first coming. He suffers humiliation. He suffers physical harm. He dies a violent substitutionary death. He dies on the cross, and that's covered by verses such as Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. That's, a, uh, that's the classic uh, representative verse of the suffering Messiah. 
All right, let's look at the triumphant side of the coin. The triumphant Messiah is, again, Yeshua of Nazareth at his second coming. Then he suffers he, then he experiences being the conquering king. He defeats Israel's enemies. He institutes the Messianic kingdom. He resurrects those trusting in him. And verses like Genesis 49, 9, and 10 support the triumphant Messiah. So the two Messiah theory really needs to be presented as the two advents of Messiah. Present to your Jewish friend the suffering aspect and the triumphant aspect side by side two aspects uh, that are fulfilled in one individual, Jesus of Nazareth. All right, well, that's a little side trip onto the two Messiah theory that's prevalent today in rabbinic circles. Let's return to the text. So we've, we're looking at three points of consolation. Number one, her warfare is accomplished. Jerusalem's warfare is accomplished. Secondly, why is it accomplished? Because her iniquity has been purged, has been pardoned. And now we come to the third section, she has received double for all her sins. Double. Now why, why double? Well, because the firstborn in a Jewish family always received double. Israel was God's firstborn in Exodus 3.22. So Israel receives double blessing, and when Israel fails, she receives double punishment. So this is the reason why the iniquity is paid for. This is a thrust of this section of Isaiah. Israel has received full punishment for her sins. And this idea of double punishment, double blessing, double responsibility is all brought out in other sections of Scripture. For example, Jeremiah 16:8. God says, I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin because they have polluted my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. And then Romans 2, 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So double blessing bring, brings upon it double responsibility, and that brings upon the, the blessed person double punishment if they forsake their responsibility. And here the tribulation and distress comes to the Jew first. And then Zechariah 9, 12. Return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This very day I am declaring that I will restore double to you. So there's this idea of double with special privilege, double privilege. The Jewish people are double privileged because we uh, not only are, are God's covenant people, but he, they, just like everyone else, he created us and we're his children. But beyond that, he has a covenant with us. We're his, we're his chosen people. So we have double blessing, special privilege. But with that double blessing comes a special responsibility, double responsibility. And with that comes special accountability, double accountability. And if we fail, then there's special discipline, double discipline. But in the end, we're promised there will be special blessing, double blessing for Israel. All right, let's take a look at some of the main points of Isaiah 40 verse 2, she has received double for all her sins. First of all, there's going to be a contrast between Israel as the whole and the faithful remnant within the nation. And then we'll look at the conditions of participation in the future redemption and glory of Israel. And finally, this will all be developed in chapter 58, 1 through 66, 24. So, and oh, by the way, all of these sections have markers very interesting marker that concludes the section. For, for example, section 1 concludes at Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. So se section 1 deals with her warfare is accomplished. Section 2 ends in 57, 21 with the statement, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So her iniquity has been pardoned. And then section three ends with the statement, they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Just another way to say it. And of course, the section three is she's received double for all her sins. All right, so let's look at the response 
to this to this uh, statement in verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 through 11, four responses to this message are going to be voiced. Four different voices are portrayed. Now the first voice is in verses 3 through 5. It is the cry of urgency in verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So this is a reference to the Eastern, uh, Eastern custom of cutting a new road or smoothing out an old one for the visit of the king. And so the point is the Lord, the king is coming, remove all the obstacles, smooth out the way that's already there. And this could have been fulfilled by John the Baptist if he had been accepted because it's applied to John the Baptist in all four Gospels. Uh, John was one of the forerunners of the Messiah and potentially could have fulfilled this prophecy. But since John was rejected, it awaits fulfillment by Elijah the prophet. Malachi chapter 4. So let's take a look at what the, uh, just one example of what the New Testament says about uh, Elijah and John the Baptist. Let's look at Mark 9 verses 9 through 13. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be, tr be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. All right, so what's the relationship? What's the relationship between John the Baptist and Elijah the prophet? Let's take a look at this. So John the Baptist is the forerunner of the first coming forerunner of the first coming. Fulfilled in Malachi 3 verse 1, Matthew 11, 7 through 10. John the Baptist was rejected as Yeshua was rejected as Messiah King. What happens to the herald will happen to the king. And he was murdered as Yeshua was murdered. What happens to the herald will happen to the king. And he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 17. <clears throat> Now Elijah, Elijah is the forerunner of the second coming. He fulfills Mal Malachi 4, 5 and Isaiah 40, verse 3. He will be accepted as Yeshua will be accepted as Messianic King. And he will come in the power of the Holy Spirit. Same power and same spirit. So I hope that makes clear the relationship between the two. Uh, John the Baptist, the forerunner of the first coming, Elijah, the forerunner of the second coming. All right, let's take a look at verse 4. Let's move on to verse 4. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. So this is a further explanation of, of a smoothing out the way. Verse 5. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. That's a reference to the Shekinah glory. When all this preparation is complete, the smoothing of the way, the removing the obstacles, all flesh will see the glory of the Lord. They're going to see the second coming. And this is revealed also in Matthew 24. Yeshua says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with what? With power and great glory, with the Shekinah glory light. So that's what Isaiah is referring to. And this is guaranteed because the mouth of the Lord has declared it. So that's the first voice. The second voice now speaks up. The second voice is heard in verse 6. A voice says, call out. Now this is the cry of hope. Cry out. Don't give up. But then a third voice answers in verses 6 and 7. 
Then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass. All its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Well, this is the voice of discouragement. This voice is discouraged about the transitory nature of, man, of mankind. And he presents two pictures. Man is like grass. It withers away. A little bit of drought, a little bit of sun, a little bit of heat. And that grass turns brown and dead. Men are like that. And the righteousness of man is like a flower. It fades away. Sure, it has a beautiful petal for a short time, but then the petals fall off and it fades away. So the spirituality of man is temporary and transitory. Why bother? What good is crying out? It's useless. Well, then the second voice in, responds in verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So the voice, this is the voice of hope. The voice of hope speaks in response to the, to the discouragement. The voice of hope says that the statements of the transitory righteousness of man are true. Yes, we're very, we realize that they're true. But in contrast, the word of God is sure. The word of God is not temporary or transitory. And therefore the promises of a final restoration and redemption are going to come to pass. So on the basis of the sure deliverance to come, proclaim the message, call out, call out. And then we have the fourth voice resounding, the voice of victory in verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. So this is a climactic cry in response to the assurances of the second voice in verse 8. The commands of verses 1 and 2 are carried out by this voice. Now the word translated good news is the modern Hebrew word for gospel, for the good news. So the way the promise of verse 2 will be realized is through proclaiming the good news, the gospel to Israel, proclaiming the Messiah, Messiah Yeshua to Israel. And then a strong encouragement follows. The encouragement is lift up your voice mightily, lift it up with strength. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, lift it up. And the recipients are the cities of Judah. So this means that someday there will be a great evangelistic campaign in Israel that will bring about the fulfillment of verse 2. And that campaign will be led by the 144,000 and the two witnesses. The contact, content of their cry, behold your God. Behold your God. Your, vo your, your God is coming soon. And he will see that he's Jesus of Nazareth. Well, in verse 10, the Messiah's relationship to the Gentiles is brought out. He's the ruler and judge of the Gentiles. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. So behold, the Lord will come. This is the second coming. And his arm will rule for him. Why? Because he's going to come as the king. He's going to rule and reign. And the arm is the Messiah. The arm of the Lord is a motif we'll see again in Isaiah. The Lord's arm is the messianic person. Now these words, reward and recompense, are judicial words. When he comes, he will render judgment on the Gentile nations. Then in verse 11, the Messiah's relationship to Israel is, is discussed. Verse 11, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. So this is his job description, the job description of the Messianic person. Four points. First of all, he will tend or he will feed his sheep. He will provide for Israel. Secondly, he will gather that's a reference to the final regathering of Israel. In other words, he's going to protect the nation. The nation will long, no longer be scattered. It'll be, it'll be um, gathered into one sheepfold. He will carry or lift them up in his bosom. This speaks of the tender care that's going to be poured out on the nation. And he will lead as a shepherd leads his, his flock, his sheep. 
So that's what the Messiah will do for Israel when he returns. And remember, verses 1 through 11 are a prologue to the chapters which follow. Now let's move on to this first major section that her warfare is accomplished. The introduction is over in verse 11. We move into verse 12. Remember the main points of, of uh, her warfare has ended. There will be a contrast shown between the Lord and idols. There will be a contrast shown between Israel and the Gentiles. We'll watch deliverance from Babylon, both near and far. The near being deliverance by Cyrus from Persia. The far being deliverance by the Messiah. And there'll be an overthrow of Babylon idolatry. And again, we start in verse 12 through chapter 48, verse 22. So we start in verse 12 with the incomparable greatness of the Lord. This is a wonderful section of Scripture. I love it. I love it dearly. The greatness of God. First of all, we begin with a description of his omnipotence, the fact that he's all powerful. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? So four rhetorical questions are asked. They're all demanding an obvious answer. And the conclusion is that God is omnipotent, all-powerful. So first of all, all the oceans can fit in the hollow of his hand. You know, all the volumes, all cubic measures, everything can fit in the palm of his hand. Here's a picture of the oceans. Remember, the earth is mostly ocean, mostly water. So it's a good picture of the entire earth just sitting in the palm of God's hand. And then the heavens merely cover a span of his hand. Now the span is simply the distance from the thumb to the pinky. That's all the span is. And so this speaks of all distances. All distances are nothing. Nothing is too far away from God. Now we might be impressed by some of the distances. Here's the Whirlpool Galaxy, you know, light years and light years away from us. It looks so far, but those distances mean nothing to God. And here's the Eagle Pillars, another very famous uh, Hubble photograph. Many, many light years away, but still, it's nothing to God. So all volumes, all cubic measure, measures are nothing to Him. All distances are nothing to Him. And Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, supports this whole idea. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. See, those are distances there, the expanse. Day to day forth, forth, pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. So the heavens declare the glory of God. All distances mean nothing to Him. He measures out the dust particles one by one, and there's a picture of a man... Uh, flipping dust particles off his hand. But God knows every one of those dust particles, you know. So all quantities mean nothing to him. Nothing is too numerous. Nothing is too small to be counted from a dust particle to a subatomic particle, a boson. All those particles, all those quantities, they're all known to God. Nothing catches him by surprise. And he weighs the mountains and the hills in a balance. So all weights are nothing to him. Nothing is too heavy for him. So God is omnipotent. Nothing is too big. Nothing is too distant. Nothing is too numerous. Nothing is too heavy for God. What a God we serve, huh? What a God we serve. Then in verses 13 and 14, uh, we discuss his omniscience, the fact that he's all-knowing. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding, and who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? So now seven rhetorical questions are again are asked, again demanding obvious answers, but leading to the conclusion that God is omniscient. Who can direct the Holy Spirit of God? Nobody. God does that. Who, who can act as the counselor to him? He's the counselor to everyone else. 
To whom does God go to advice? Again, he gives his advice out to mankind, not the reverse. Who instructs him? There's no one available to do that. Who teaches him justice? He is the source of justice. Who teaches him knowledge? He is the source of knowledge. Who taught him the way of understanding? There's nobody out there. He is understanding personified. He is all-knowing, omniscient. And then the significance of the nations is brought out in contrast to God. First of all, they're very small. A lot of nations don't like this evaluation of what they are. Verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are regarded as a speck, a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust, like a drop in a bucket, nothing like a dust particle that doesn't tip the scale. Nobody worries about a dust particle on a scale. And this includes the world's largest nation, Russia. Here's a picture of Russia, the world's largest nation. It's a drop in the bucket. But also that applies to the United States of America, the world's most powerful nation. We are just a dust speck on a scale. And all the nations should understand and in humility accept that evaluation. So the nations are small, the nations are insufficient in their relationship to God. Verse 16, even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. So all the trees of Lebanon cannot burn long enough to atone for a nation's sin. There's a forest fire, a picture of a mountain, all a fire. None of those trees would be enough to atone for a nation's sin. Here's another incredible forest fire picture. All those burning trees, not, not, that's not enough. You could burn them all up, but it's not enough to atone for a nation's sin. And the abundance of animals is not enough for a, an offering. You can have all the animals in the world lined up on an altar and burnt as a burnt offering, but it's not enough to atone for mankind's sin. There's not enough sheep, goats, or cattle to do this. And so the nations are nothing in verse 17. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. That includes our own nation. It includes your nation. Uh, you, you who are watching here, we're all in the same boat. We're nothing. We're nothingness. We're confusion. That's all we are. But in contrast, God is incomparable. That's the conclusion we're supposed to reach in verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? You can't compare him with anyone or anything. But you know what? Human beings try to constantly. This is why God forbids idolatry. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 18. So watch yourself carefully. Since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. See, he's incomparable. You didn't see anything when he spoke to you. So that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves of the form of any figure. Don't try to put God into a form, into the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. Now, God condescends to anthropomorphisms. And anthropomorphism is attributing hum human characteristics to something non-human. He can appear in human form, in the angel, uh, for example, the angel of the Lord. And he will put on a human body in Jesus of Nazareth. But that is his prerogative. He can do that. But we, we don't have the permission to cook up our own descriptions of God. Let God take care of describing himself, because we don't know him well enough. He's not like us. So God now begins to deal with the most offensive of all human attempts to compare him, and that's idols. Uh, he begins by mocking the expensive idols in verse 19. As for the idol, uh, as for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, a silversmith fashions chains of silver. So this is the expensive idol. Now here's a picture of a, uh, a, a temple with some idols in it. These are gold-plated idols that look like, at least painted gold, if not gold-plated. So these are expensive idols. Here's another one. Look at the size of that idol. Uh, now it's not silver-plated, but it's painted silver, isn't it? 
But no matter what, it costs a lot of money to manufacture that thing, to create that thing. Okay, but it's nothing. It's not a, 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 an accurate representation of God. So the expensive idol isn't good enough. The cheap idol isn't good enough either. Verse 20, he who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He, he seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. And so um, the economy version isn't any better. This is for the person who can't afford gold or silver. So he chooses wood that won't rot because it's not nice to have your God rot. So he'll choose cedar probably. He chooses a skillful man to carve the idol because it's not good to have your God look sloppy. And he chooses to require the man to make a strong base for the idol. It's not nice for a God to tip over. Now here's a tiny little God. This one's not very big, so it's not nearly as expensive. But look at the big solid base that it's resting upon. And we can't have our God tipping over or being knocked over. Because, and he's con talking in contrast to the Gentile idol worshipers, because you're dealing with the God of eternity in verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? And the implication is yes. They have known all about God. They've known from the beginning that he was there. They've known from the foundations of earth that he was there. And that's what Romans chapter 1 talks about. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. How? Since the creation of the world, you know, since the, the beginning, since the beginning, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which has been made. So they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, that's who we're talking about now in Isaiah, for an image, an image in the form of corruptible man, or of birds, or four-footed animals, or crawling creatures. So we have known about God from the beginning, from the foundations of the earth, and we've turned our back on him. And yet, God is transcendent. Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, excuse me, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So the Bible has always taught the roundness of the earth. Here's a picture from, from uh, orbit, and the earth is a round ball hung on nothing. The Bible has always declared that. And he says that men appear like grasshoppers. See, there's the hand. The hand is the hand of God. The man is the grasshopper. If we're just the grasshoppers, how much more are the things that we make? And then he says, the heavens are stretched out like a curtain. The Hebrew means a thin, transparent fabric. It's a good description of the thinness of the sky and the clouds, like this picture here. He spreads them out as easily as a shepherd spreads out his tent. Then God's relationship to rulers is described in verse 23. They're nothing. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. So rulers are brought to nothing, to confusion. There's a lot of rulers in this world that don't like that, uh, that is assessment of themselves. Rulers are temporary in verse 24. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. Now uh, this is in contrast to God himself. And this brings to mind to me the traditional and but theologically accurate addition to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I like this in Matthew 6.13. 6, we often get this traditional 
we, uh, we often see this traditional liturgical addition to the Lord's Prayer. Oh, there goes my time, so I'll have to wrap this up in just a few minutes. That traditional addition says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So King Messiah possesses the kingdom. Yeshua has the proper right to rule. Messiah King possesses the power. Yeshua has the proper ability to rule. King Messiah possesses the glory. Yeshua is the proper object of rule. And King Messiah is forever. Yeshua possesses the proper duration of rule forever. Not like the, the leaders of the world, the leaders of this earth, they get breathed on. God just breathes on them and they're gone. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Because God is unique in verse 25. To whom will you liken me then that I would be his equal, says the Holy God. To be, for God to be equal with anything, to, to make God equal to anything is to demean God, to bring him down. All right, looks like we better stop there. Looks like we better stop there. We'll pick it up on verse 26 as we continue this description of our God. Well, let me, let me go through verse 26. I'll just take another minute and go through verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. This speaks of the power of God. He created the innumerable stars of the universe. He calls them all by name. You know, this is the Hubble ultra deep field picture uh, out into the universe and all those dots are not stars they are galaxies each galaxy containing billions of stars here's another picture of the Hubble ultra deep field look at that thousands and thousands and thousands of dots and they're all galaxies they're all made up of thousands and thousands and thousands of innumerable stars you know, he calls them all by name. To us, they're uncountable, but he calls them all by name. And how did he create them? By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. And not one of them is lacking. When he names them, he won't skip even one. All right, let's bring this to a close now. We'll pick it up next session with the application of all this to Israel in chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. We'll pick it up next session with the point. This is the point of God describing his greatness. He's going to apply it to Israel. So we'll see you then. Thanks so much for being our students. Lehi Lehitraot.